So we're going to get started in the Word of God tonight, book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter number two. So I'm going to do a little bit of review because I know it's been a week ago and I'm sure you remember everything we talked about last Wednesday and uh, we're going to go ahead and do a little bit of review. But let's look at Hebrews chapter two. We're going to start in verse number one. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 1. Now let's do a little bit review uh, preliminarily to our introduction. So church, uh, who do we believe to be the author of the book of Hebrews? Meaning the pen. Who is the person that God used to do that? Who do we believe that's the case? Paul. And uh, later on, now does it specifically say in the Bible, Paul wrote it? No, it does not say that specifically. Uh, there is some debate on who is the actual person. That did write. Now, I'll give you my personal uh, take on things because uh, it's not like you're looking for my opinion on the matter. But uh, there are some things that lend to why the uh, anonymity uh, of, the, of the writer. Because, well, again, you think about Paul and Saul, what he used to do. He was a persecutor of the church uh, with the Jews. He went out martyring Jews that were uh, they were uh, they had converted from Judaism to Christianity, and he went out and martyred them. And because of that, there was still a lot of, if you will, uh, apprehension to receive Paul now into some of these churches because of his background. And it's a possibility. Now it's not again. It's not outlined in Hebrews chapter one through thirteen, but using our our rational thinking. It's a possibility that maybe to make sure the letter was received, it was anonymous. Uh, but also, uh, we know that it's, it has a lot of similar traits in Paul's writing style. Um, there are mentions and little hints throughout Hebrews that talk about the writer's state in which he was in. And so a lot of things we'll look forward to, uh, but for time's sake, I don't want to steal those, steal those points from the other, other parts of Scripture. But... Um, so, looking now again, uh, the book of Hebrews, what was the real mode or why was it really written to these people? Anybody want to give me just there what we think and what happened, Brother Allen? That's true. Yep, they, he addressed that in the first in the first chapter, but the the actual overall purpose of the book was to address how Christ was more important than we looked at in Hebrews chapter 1, but also because, quite simply, the, these Hebrews were just spiritual babies. They were immature. They were stunted in their growth. And so the writer here, and, and inspired by God, uses this book to try to stimulate growth in the life of the Christian. No Christian will grow without faith. You need faith in your life. This is why Hebrews largely deals with a lot of faith and uh, we'll see that in Hebrews chapter in Hebrews chapter 11 the, it's called the hall of faith and we look at how uh, different characters of the Bible were used uh, for, and, and, and expounded upon their faith so that's largely why the book of Hebrews was written uh, now the two key words in the book of Hebrews are what better and perfect some of you are catching on amen and better and perfect. Now, dealing with the Christian, can we be perfect? No. Perfect in the, in the definition of sinless. No, we cannot be. Who is perfect, though? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our model. He is our, 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 our target, if you will, to be like in the, or in the regard of being perfect. I've said before, you cannot be sinless, but you can sin less. You can do less sin. And that is the mark of a Christian who's spiritually maturing, the desire to stop sinning. Now, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, What shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So we see that the mark of a, a spiritually immature Christian is a, is a, is a desire, a habitual uh, yearning to continue to sin. Now, just because I don't necessarily have a strong desire to do wrong, I'll inevitably do wrong. Why? Because I have the flesh. The flesh is still present on me, man, I, and it still has it. It rears its ugly head from time to time. And we, as, as maturing Christians, must do our due diligence to crucify the flesh daily, Brother Paul talks about. Now, in, in the regard of the Christian now, 
The word perfect is, is what? Defined as what? Mature. It, it's, a, it's a process of maturing. And you, or in other words, another word for that is complete. Mature or complete. These two words are, are synonymous. They have the similar meaning to the word perfect. So don't get hung up on that. God's not telling you, I expect you to be perfect. Because he knows who you are. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We all sin. So there, it's completely impossible for you to be perfect. But you can be better. Amen? That's the other key word. You can be better. You can do better. You can serve better. You can give better. You can act better. You can do more for him. Uh, now, in the context of Christ, Christ is better is talking about a relationship. It's compare and contrast. Now, the Bible says we are not wise if we compare ourselves to ourselves. So I'm not saying here that, you know, am I better than Brother Mikhail? Yes, I am. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> hey, I'll arm wrestle you, man. All right. <laughs> but... Uh, we are not to compare ourselves. So I'm not going to say I'm better than Brother Allen or Brother Allen's better than Brother Tudor. That's, that's not wise. We're not supposed to do that as Christians. But who are we to compare to? Jesus Christ. He is our goal. He is our target. Uh, they say that uh, act, there's a difference between accuracy and precision. Anybody uh, shoot targets or do firearm or bow. What is the difference between accuracy and precision? Brother, Brother McNeely, I'm going to go ahead and just call on you. What's the difference between accuracy and precision? And you know what? We as Christians, we have a target. We have a goal. We are to be precise in our... Now, can we be precise in being wrong? Can I be, can I be off target and still be consistent? Yes, I can. I can consistently shoot in the woods instead of the target. <laughs> I can miss the target by a mile, but hey, at least I'm shooting in the same area. But here's the, here's the goal. God says, we want you to be accurate. We want you to, I want you to hit the target. I want you to see the goal and be, and be precise in your accuracy. So I wanted it to expound it on that a little bit in the term better. Now, looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, let's read these things. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word be spoken, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will? Now, we have talked here about the word, how shall we escape if we, the, the phrase rather, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, is this church the same salvation that you experienced on the day you got saved? Is that what it's referring to? No, no it's not. What, what is this verse dealing with then? You remember what this verse is addressing? It's talking about escaping the chastisement of God. And so we see that it's in the context of condemnation, it's talking about eternal death. That's condemnation. Chastisement is for the believer. God does not chastise the world. He judges the world, and he will inevitably condemn the world because of their sin. We are not condemned because we as believers have trusted upon Jesus Christ, and our sin was dealt with at the cross. So this, this ideology that there are some, pre, there are some preachers who say, you need to be careful what you do because you know, you're going to face them in heaven one day. No, that's not true. Because if you are a Christian, your sin was dealt with at the cross. That's why you're, you have no concern about eternal security. You're not going to worry about whether or not you're going to go to hell. Because God already dealt with that. The Bible says Christ has, has suffered once for sins. So it's one, and, and the Bible says, for all have sinned. Excuse me, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him 
shall not perish, but of everlasting life. That's another verse on eternal security. Uh, so again, Jesus is not bringing up our sins before us in heaven. He's not going to do that. So be thankful. Uh, when I was a kid, I'm going to put this on, Brother Carter. I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. When I was a kid, I used to be deathly afraid of, you know, uh, see, I had a problem with cheating in school. It wasn't because, it wasn't because I was dumb. It was just because I was lazy. And I didn't want to, I just didn't want to do the work to study. And I could, I could have easily, easily studied. And I was a student who got all A's. And uh, I graduated three, I, I was messing around in ninth grade, but I graduated with a 3.95 GPA. And you know what? I was, man, I studied, but I was a, I was a cheater. And uh, I just, I would get the, I would get the test keys. You let, I'm, I'm confessing right now, okay? I'd get the test keys, and I'm, mom and dad, I'm sorry, uh, I would memorize the entire test, all the answers. And I would, I would do it. C, D, A, B, A. F, G, E, A, C, B, and I would memorize them all in order, and I just, boop, 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 because I had no notes to go off, it was all up here, and I couldn't find out, but then inevitably, they found out, but you know, I was deathly afraid, God's going to say, all right, Matthew Thorpe, uh, when you were in 10th grade, you cheated on your final exam. And I was afraid that all of Christianity would know all the things that I ever did. And listen, I'm happy to tell you that's not the case. All right? That's not what's going to happen. What will happen is God will bring out our works that we did for him or the works that we've done. And the Bible talks about whether they'll be gold, silver, precious stone or what? What hand stubble. That will be visible before all the world. And you know what? To be honest with the preacher, to me, that's just as concerning. The world's going to know how really dedicated I was to Christ. All the things that I did for him, whether or not they were really done for him. And I'll be honest with you, I'm constantly evaluating whether or not I'm doing things for his sake or I'm doing them for the sake of just doing it. And I want to challenge you, if you serve in a ministry and you signed up, man, one, thank you for doing that. But two, make sure you're not doing it for this guy up here. Right. Yeah. Don't do it for me because my thanks is very shallow. Not because I don't have a heart of wanting to thank you, but listen, you're, you would be much more rewarded in heaven for what you're doing versus me giving my shallow thanks. And so Jesus is, or excuse me, Paul is addressing how shall we escape and this escape is from chastisement, the chastisement of our disobedience to God. Because if we do not grow in faith, listen, it's because you are deciding not to. God has given you all the resources for you to grow in him. He gave you the church. He gave you his book. He gave you, uh, he gave you a command. He told you to go out. And listen, I'm sorry, but... If you're not coming to church, and if you're not faithful in God's house, you are a disobedient Christian. Yes, sir. You are. You are spiritually immature. You ought to know, as in some, some seasoned Christians, they still haven't grasped this. Right. Anytime, I, I'm going to preach here real quick. I know it's Bible study. But anytime Jesus, when it came to the Sabbath, you know where he was. He was in the synagogue. He was preaching or listening to preaching, listening to the Bible. And if God in the flesh could see it important to come to church, then friend, what is our excuse? I don't know. I, I, I happen to feel like if anybody had a reason to not go to church, it would probably be God. <laughs> but you know what? He set the example for us. He gave us the example to follow. He's not going to expect you to do something that he himself didn't do. Isn't that good? Isn't that nice to hear? And he gives us the example. Again, he's not giving any gray areas what about what he expects out of us. He gives us clear commands. So even though you might have a Bible study at your home on Sunday morning, that ain't church. It's not. Church is ecclesia, a called out assembly. You know what we do? We're calling you out. To be here. Now, is this the church? No. We are the church. And last, last I checked, I'm not at your house. You're not at mine. We're not at each other's house. 
Now, if we gather together at Brother Tudor's house, there's church. But listen, we have a responsibility to spiritually grow up and be where we ought to be. That's where the challenge is. If we don't, here's what happens, chastisement. And we talked about the motives of chastisement last week. i got to hurry and finish up this review. But the motive for chastisement is love. And the purpose of chastisement is to make us holy, to be more like his son, Jesus Christ, God's son. Uh, there are three basic attitudes a Christian might experience when being chastened by the Lord. We talked about them. Number one, he may despise it. He may hate it. He may stiffen under the hand of God. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. I've seen some Christians who have hardened their neck and God destroyed. Now, I didn't say he killed them, but their life was pretty much a wreck. And they did it to themselves. They did it to themselves. Number two, they may fate under it. Simply this, to give up or to quit. Uh, and then lastly, he may submit to God. And this is in Hebrews chapter 12. I'll show you that and then we'll just be done with this review. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. Uh, for, verily, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So why does, why does God chastise the Christian? For your profit. For your profit. To, and now, I, I know that's a hard thing to, to comprehend sometimes, that God would chastise us for, to make it profitable. But here's, what, here's what's happening. Uh, I told somebody today, um, they were talking about the, the difference of the world 20, 30 years ago versus now. And, uh, I, and I told her, I said, well, I can tell you it's probably because people are getting a whole lot less whoopings than they used to. A whole lot less whoopings. And I said, you know what? I said, I wasn't, I wasn't a terrible kid, but I was a bad kid many times. And you know what? I'm glad I had parents who gave me a good old-fashioned whooping. Amen. Good. The, Bible, the Bible says, he that spareth the rod hateth his child. So any parent that chooses, now be, kids, be glad your mom and dad love you. <laughs> but the Bible says, he that spareth the rod hateth his child. So if you're going to withhold correction, guess what you're saying to your kid? I don't love you enough to care about you. You're right. Right. Yes, sir. Right. And you know what God's not saying? That. He says, because I love you, I cannot let you continue this pattern of behavior. And sometimes God brings methods of correction in our life. to. Here's, 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 the, here's the thing. Okay, When you're going down the road <clears throat> and you go off the road just a little bit, what happens? Well, you have to take a minor correction, right? Minor correction for minor changes. But when you have a major change, what happens? Major correction, right? Same case with God. God's not going to boom because you missed church on Sunday. But you continue to veer off, veer off, veer off. You catch what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, major correction. God says, okay, you've gone far enough. It's time to bring you back. Again, we always talk about that. God has leashes on people. You know, figuratively speaking, he has leashes on us to make sure that we don't wander far. And if I were you, I'd be praying that God keep a short, short leash on you because I don't want to wander far. I don't want those major corrections. I don't want it to be the case that God might maybe take one of my children home as a result of chastisement. Does he do that? Oh, he can. He can. Anything that's a a object of love more than him is territory. Right. And God gave us those kids and God can take them home. Yes, sir. Right. And I would, I would never forgive myself that I would cause that in my, in my home and in my life. That's why I must be cautious about how I live my life as a Christian. Because there is such thing as chastisement. Back to Hebrews chapter 2. Now we talk, here's new, new material. Uh, why did Christ become flesh? This is where we left off at, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, for, unto, uh, for unto the angels hath he not put into subjection the word to come, wherewith we speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? What's this talking about? Well, it's the, it's the, it's the incredulous thought that, that Jesus would even come to this world, to even think about mankind, to even consider us. I mean, I'm not, I'm not anything to write home about. I'm not. But the fact that God would care, he would, he would send his son from a, from a holy heaven, come down to this wicked, ungodly, going-to-hell world, 
that he, that he would be mindful of us, that he would think of us. The Bible says that we are the apple of his eye. Yet, how do we respond to him? How do, well, many times we're like that spoiled brat. We disobey. We, we are rebellious. And, but God says, you're the apple of my eye. And he's mindful of us. And this is why, again, he, one, he came. But two, why he's invested in your life. He cares about you. Um, the Bible says in verse 7, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. How? Because he donned flesh upon his life. Upon his, upon his as a, he, he, he was robed in flesh, the Bible talks about. <clears throat> Thou crownest him with the glory and honor, and did set him, uh, did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things but put under him. And what is this verse talking about? Well, uh, we left off in, ver- in point number one, Christ became flesh in order to have dominion over the earth. That's what this is talking about, where it talks about the works of his hands. Uh, the, um, uh, in verse number seven, as I talked about, Adam had dominion over the earth. You remember, God gave him authority over everything that God created. <clears throat> and, uh, and eventually what happened was Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of the fruit of good and, or the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And if, inevitably what, what happened was their disobedience, there was chastisement. Uh, number one, they, they lost that, that, that perfection. They were no, no longer sinless. They had sinned. And number two, because of that, <clears throat> they, they were thrust out of the garden. They were no longer permitted to be in that place of holiness. That perfect environment. God says, you have to go out. Adam was no longer, did no, no longer had dominion over the animals, over God's creation. <clears throat> Hence why Simba is coming to eat us if we're in, in front of him, all right? That's why, you know, Allie the alligator is coming over to, to chomp your leg off when you're going hunting, fellas. You no longer have authority and dominion because of the curse of sin. But now, Jesus has come and he has... He has reestablished dominion. That's why we talked about second Adam from above, the song, the Christmas song, that now it is establishing that he now has dominion over the earth. And now he is in control of all those things. Not to say he wasn't to begin with, because God is in control of everything, but it's a, it's a right, it's an authority, it's a picture of authority that God is setting forth to us. And uh, because Adam did this, because Eve did this, it caused an ultimate, uh, ultimate consequence for that. Now, um, because he did, he can now rule the earth as the perfect man. God's promise to man of dominion over the earth will be fulfilled in Jesus when he returns to reign. Now, will there ever be a point where that goes back to the day of the Garden of Eden? Yes. During the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about the, the, the lion will lay with the lamb. That's not, that's not symbolism. That's reality. That's what will happen. Um, you won't have to worry about uh, those cotton mouths biting at your legs. You won't have to worry about all those animals coming after you because God will remove that from them and will be a once again perfect environment. And this will be during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, that thousand years. Will that be a new earth? No, it will not be a new earth. It will be this earth where Jesus is ruling and reigning. After the seven years tribulation, are you going to be here, church? Are you going to be here during the seven years of tribulation? No. How do we know that? I had a discussion about this not too long ago. How do we know that? Well, let's look at the principles. Let's look at the principles of the word of God. When God judged the earth the last time, what happened? A what? A flood. This is off topic, but it's, it's, it's somehow applicable here. It's Bible study. We're learning a lot about the Bible, right? But... What did, what did God do to the people who believed on him? Had him built an ark, right? The ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of salvation. All right? When that rain, that judgment came down, what did that ark do? It what? What happened, Brother McNeely? It floated above the judgment of God. Guess where you're going to be, Christian? Above the judgment of God. God's reigning, or his, his wrath of, uh, of, of chastisement on his people, because that's what the tribulation's for, the Jew, right? 
And because of, because of the rejection of the Messiah and because of the rejection of, of God, God's chastising them and he's lumping in the world because of how they've treated Israel. Now, you as the believers, you will not be in the world. And I can show you that in scripture. But you will not be in the world because why would God, why would, why would God want to punish the bride of Christ? What did she do wrong? Did she do anything wrong? No? Why would God, I mean, dear sir, would you want to subject your wife to punishment? You know, everybody's, everybody's uh, you know, mad at you, getting, you know, throwing insults at you, and you're just going to go around and slap your wife because they said something to you? No. no. <laughs> uh, and I will have marital counseling after this, so if you need me, I'll be in the office. Okay, but here, here's what I'm trying to say. That's, that's not chastisement what the world is doing to the world. That's to the Jew, because that's, again, his child, the children of Israel, the children of God. We are the bride of Christ. And I, so I just wanted to clarify that here, because that will be a new era, a new, a new and then that will be this, the finality of God's dominion over the earth, and they will turn back over to mankind after all that's done. Number two, Christ became flesh in order to die for men. Look at verse number nine. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the what? Suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So did Jesus die? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I, I heard somebody say, the, uh, you know, I don't know how it's all symbolism, it, you know, it's, but it's, it's ironic that the same thing that was resulted in the curse of sin, thorns, that resulted as a curse of sin, it was the same thing that Jesus bore upon his head. The same object that grabbed the fruit out of the tree was the same object that was pierced on the day of crucifixion. And, and here's, the, here's the point. Jesus came to earth for the sole purpose to die for you and to die for me. And that's why he became flesh. Because he, could, he had to have flesh to be crucified. He had to have a body to be crucified. So he tasted death for us. <clears throat> now, the Bible says that Jesus went to the belly of the earth. And there was a lot of debate on this about what that is exactly. Now, when I think of the belly, where do you think? The center. Now, prior to this, and again, the Bible talks about it, but prior to this, Jesus, and this is, this is my personal belief on this, but Jesus, there is, a, there were, there is a, a holding place for those that believed Jesus Christ prior to his crucifixion, and that was called, uh, uh, that was called Sheol, but there's Gehenna and Sheol. And Sheol, they were both in the, in the, in the belly of, of the earth, one was a place of storage for the believers. The other was a place of torment for the non-believing people who died. And Jesus, Bible talks about that led the captive free. They were, and they were captive in that place. They were not being punished because, again, they trusted in the, the, their, their faith-filled sacrificial atonements, the temporary coverings. They believed on that. It was looking forward to the event that Jesus was going to come to the earth to die on the cross. That was a looking forward event. Now, let me just stop right there because I don't want you to be confused about this. When, when the Old Testament, what counted them for salvation? We're going to see that in Hebrews chapter 11. But what, what, count, what, what counted them for salvation. It was simply this. It was a looking forward to the event. Why did they sacrifice the lamb? Why did they do all the sacrificing? Because it was saying, we believe that you're going to do something, God. We don't know what it is just yet or who you're going to send, but we are looking forward to this event and we're going to obey you through our faith. We're going to act on that. Same thing now. We look back and we pray. It's our act of faith. We pray. It's similar to sacrifice. It's an act of our faith looking back to the event of Jesus' crucifixion. And this is why Jesus died, so that we could have forgiveness of sins, so that we could be absolved from our sin, to have atonement for our sin. And then number three, Christ became flesh in order to be our elder brother. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth 
and they who are the sanctified are all for all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them what? Brethren. Brethren. Who is this talking about again? It's talking about Jesus Christ. He's calling you his brother. Why is that? Because of the sacrifice on the cross and because the, the atonement was made for your sin, you were adopted into the family of God. Right? You were adopted into the family of God. We call that the elect. Now, don't get hung up on that word because I know Calvinists and Calvinism uses that word a lot. The elect is this. God has chosen everybody, but only some have responded. Think of that parable that Jesus taught <clears throat> when he talked about the, the marriage. Remember, he said, go out and compel them to come in. Tell them, go on the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. <clears throat> but then what happened? Nobody came. So he said, go out, go out and, and um, for, lack of, for lack of remembering the verse, he said, go out and get all the, 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 the unsightly people, all the people that <clears throat> were not invited. We're going to invite them now. They were the elect. They chose to be there. And just like you, you chose to be in the family of God when you said, God, please forgive me of my sin. I know I'm a sinner. And you called upon God. You became the child of God. And now you are brethren with Jesus Christ. He is the son of God. But we also are sons and daughters of God. So that's the wonderful truth that Jesus provided a status of relationship because of what he did. Prior to that, we were the creation of God. That was it. We were just the creation of God. But because of Jesus Christ, we are now the children of God. And somebody asked me, I, I was doing a promotion, I was asking somebody to donate a bunch of pumpkins. We had a great pumpkin giveaway uh, at our church the last Sunday of October, and, and no, it wasn't for carving pumpkins, all right? We, don't have, we, didn't, we didn't take credibility for what they did with the pumpkins after it, okay? We don't believe in Halloween, but we just believe in giving up pumpkins to kids, you know, just something like kids like, I guess. But, you know, I, I talked to this lady. She was the owner of an of a, of a orchard, and uh, there are a bunch of orchards where I came from, and, and uh, she said, well, I'll give them to you on one condition, she said, one time my kids went to the church there and they, told, they were told that they were going to go to hell. I said, okay. Yeah, that's probably true. And they said, but I happen to believe that we're all children of God. Every one of us. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll tell you this. We are all God's creation. Okay, that's good enough. You can have the pumpkins. <laughs> I got pumpkins. I got 60 pumpkins for free. Hey, my, hey. That was the easiest, easiest $600 uh, answer I could ever given. <laughs> but listen, we are not all God's children. We are not. We are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. We are only God's children by an act of being involved in God's family, by an act of faith. Uh, we're going to finish up with this and look at, keep reading in verse number, uh, verse number 12. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I the, and the children which God hath given me. Uh, now, all who trust Christ are part of God's family. Can a Catholic be a part of God's family? Yeah, they can be. Can a Presbyterian? Can a Methodist? Can a Muslim? They can, if... They believe on the fundamentals of how a person gets saved. Now, can a person get saved and still practice their doctrine and theology? Maybe. Yeah, they can. In, in, in practicality, they can. But here's, here's what happens. A person who's truly, genuinely saved, they're going to eventually grow, and they're going to get out of that. Eventually. I mean, if they, this, I'm not a Baptist because my dad was. I'm not a Baptist because my grandpa was. I'm a Baptist because I read the Bible. Now, I'm going to say this. If the Baptist movement, and that's why we are independent, fundamental, we, are, we aren't lumped in a group. We're not garb. We're not, a, uh, we're not the General Association of Regular Baptists, which I don't believe 
uh, ought to be a, the, the flagship of which a church goes under. We don't have a mother church that we look up to. We are an independent local body of believers. That's the way the Church of Galatia operated. That's the way the Church of Phili uh, uh, the Philippians uh, operated. That's the practical principle we see in the Word of God. But can all these people look to God and get saved and still live in their live in there in their their church and I know a lot of people who are Catholics who actually got saved they just cannot break away from tradition but again we are still the family of God uh, Christ became flesh to defeat the devil Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 through 16 aren't you glad for that one for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death who is that the devil. So what it says in verse number 14. And we're going to have to wrap it up here with these last few verses. We'll come back together next week to continue this. Verse 15. And deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now what does the Bible say? For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love of sound mind. Who is trying to give us spirits of fear? The devil, that's his, that's his number one weapon to get you to fear. That's why, man, he was running rampant during COVID. Right. Running rampant, causing people to be <gasps> fearful. And all the while, God is saying, shame, shame on you. I didn't, I didn't teach you to be that way. I didn't give you this book for you to be fearful. Right. I, I told a preacher, we talked about this today. Fear is a form of atheism. Because you're saying, God, I don't think you're capable, or I don't know if you exist, but I don't think you're capable of taking care of my needs. I don't think you're in control. I don't think there is a God who is in control. That's what we're saying in practice. Let's be sure that we're not filled with fear. That's why, you know what, if you get sick, hey, I'll be honest with you. I told somebody today, if I was destined, if God's will said, I'm going to live till 90 years old, there ain't anything that's going to change that. Other than me electing to take myself out of this world, that's not going to happen. Or God says, okay, you're done at 40 years old. Is there anything I'm going to do that's going to change that? So we cannot live in fear because of that, church. We should not live in fear. We should live with a sound mind. Let's keep going. Um, the Bible says in uh, uh, well, verse number 16 will be the last one. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now in 1 John 4, 4, the Bible says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And uh, we're going to have to stop there because I don't want to go too far. But I want, to, I want to give you one last point and then we'll address that next week. And we'll, we'll expound a little bit more on this. But now, lastly, Christ became flesh in order to be our high priest. Christ became flesh in order to be our high priest. We'll talk about that next week. I want to challenge you and encourage you to be here. And uh, you know what? Talk to somebody. Invite them to come on, uh, on Sunday I, or Wednesday. I invited somebody today. I said, hey, listen, you know, I'm talking about the Bible. Talk about the book of Hebrews. I want to challenge you to come out and hear, see what the Bible has to say about faith as a Christian. And I know it'll transform your life. And they said, oh, wow, you know, I really would like to. And I said, well, just join us on stream and then kind of inch your way into our church. How about that? But I want to encourage you to be here as often as you can as we continue to study the book of Hebrews. Hey, did you learn something tonight? Yeah. I know every time I open the word of God, there isn't a time that I'm not learning something. So let's be sure we be students of the Bible. Let's stand as we begin to pray. I don't know if God has spoken to your heart. I know he's spoken to mine. But I want to challenge you and encourage you, church. Let's yield to God. Let's submit to him. Let's obey him. And especially in the, in the matter of building our faith, in the matter of being obedient, let's make sure that we grow. Let's make sure that we yield to him. I don't want God to have to chastise me to motivate me to be more growing, to be more faithful. Let's be sure to just submit to God. And the piano is going to begin to play. If God spoke to your heart tonight, you just make, you make in your heart the decision that God has pressed upon you to make.